Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. David, welcome to the Australian Finance Podcast. Thanks a lot, Owen. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to chat. Uh, to chat with someone who has probably deeper knowledge of the ETF market than just about anyone in the country. So um, I know that's a big intro to follow, but um, I'm pretty sure you're up for it, mate. Oh, well, thanks a lot. That's, that's very kind of you. Always uh, are, always love being here. Um, what are you doing? Cheers, mate. So today we're going to be talking about the ETF market as a whole and then drilling down into things like portfolio construction and core and satellite uh, because you recently did a presentation which was really interesting. And when I shared some of the slides, uh, admittedly without your permission, so I do apologize, but when I sh- sent, sent a screenshot of one of the slides out that you did, um, it kind of got some feedback, some really positive and some negative feedback and um, as in people contesting the, the, the beliefs that we kind of or you kind of mm. showed on that slide, which we'll cover today. Yeah. But um, the ETF market is now, I don't know exactly what it is today at the time of recording, but I'm pretty sure it's over $150 billion. Right. That's right. Are you surprised by how big it's become? No, no, I'm not. I mean, in the first instance, we've really got precedent in other markets, especially in the US, on the stellar growth of their ETF markets. So in many respects, it's just a case of global trends coming to Australia. But also, I think the underlying drivers of the growth of the ETF industry remain very, very firmly in place. And the underlying drivers are sort of these two trends which are converging. The first of which is across financial services in general, we've seen a migration away from high fee services towards low fee services. And across the funds management industry in particular, we've seen a shift, a strong shift away from active fund managers towards passive fund managers instead. Mm. The reason for both these shifts is ultimately the same. Lower fee funds perform better simply because the fee on your ETF or the fee on your managed fund or your superannuation fund is taken out of the NAV. Therefore, there is a direct trade-off, a direct mathematical trade-off between how high a fund's fees are and how well it can perform. Hmm. The second fact, of course, is just active versus passive. We've been through so many speed of scorecards, so many academic studies, all showing the same thing. Passive outperforms active, especially once you take fees and transaction costs and taxes into account. So ETFs, which are passive and low fee, have sort of benefited from both these trends Mm. converging on it. And so in all, I'm not surprised at all to see the growth of the ETF market in Australia like Mm. this. No, Mm. It's it's really eloquent to put it down to those two things, which you said are converging and they're effectively one and the same in that it's the after fee performance that most people care about. And um, this is where I've always been a bit mystified by the, the debate other than for, I guess, um, agency or, uh, you know, people kind of protecting their jobs. Um, I've always been a bit confused why so many people think that active is still the predominant driver of like wealth into the future. I just, I just can't see that happening. It always has, I think we'll always have a place, but um, whether or not it's, you know, as popular as it is today. Um, one of the things that we've also seen this, this year mate, is it the, the shift towards yield-focused ETFs, so not just like straight-up Aussie shares or straight-up global shares, for example, but people using ETFs. I mean, you guys had the gold ETF for so many years, and it's still by far and away the most popular gold ETF in the country. But um, have you? I guess have you been taken back at all by the the shift towards bond ETFs? You're exactly right. So. By our numbers, about 47% of inflows into ETFs as of uh, at least the end of October were into bond ETFs as compared to just 23% of inflows Mm. last year over the same period. So there has been a notable upswing in inflows into bond ETFs this year. Are we surprised? No, I would say is the general answer. And we have benefited from this, uh, this shift enormously ourselves 
in that our US Treasury ETF, USTB, has seen something to the effect of half a billion flow into it over the past 12 months. Um, but perhaps to address the question behind the question, um, why have bond ETFs suddenly uh, gotten so popular? For me, it comes down to three main reasons. The first of which is your income story. With interest rates globally rising over the past two years, bonds are offering good income again. And here, it's very important to remember that while you may get the impression looking in the newspapers that the big drivers of the global ETF industry are millennial investors, the reality is the big drivers of the ETF industry in Australia and in the US are financial advisors and ultimately their clients. Mm. Now, the average financial advisor's client in Australia is 60 years old, according mm. to advisor ratings. So income is very important for this demographic. And with income on these bond ETFs being high by historical standards, that makes, it a, that makes them a very, very attractive proposition for this core market for ETFs. Mm. So that's the first thing. The second thing I think it's uh, worth uh, just touching on as to why these bond ETFs have seen such renewed popularity is just the simple fact that they can be used by tactical traders too to potentially front run interest rate cuts. When interest rates fall, the value of bonds, bonds prices rise. They're inversely related. Mm. With a lot of people in the market now thinking we're at the peak of central banks raising rates and with a lot of people expecting rate cuts to come into play next year, bond ETFs to many people provide a tool that you can use to front run those rate cuts and make a profit when the cycle turns. So you're exactly right, strong growth in bond ETFs, but we're not surprised at Global X, mm. not at all. It's, uh, it's really interesting. I didn't know that the average financial advice client was 60, but that's definitely represented in our data too, because on some of our podcasts, David, the, the average age is about 50. And basically, the not the number one thing, but like in the top five things for sure is how do I speak to a financial planner or how do I speak to a financial advisor? Like they're going to become those clients. And um, we've definitely seen that in some of our topics this year, people searching for yield and income and these types of things, especially on our investors podcast. One thing you often hear uh, from clients and or financial advisors or even your parents or your grandparents if you're a little bit younger listening to this is you know i remember buying cba shares or i remember buying insert bhp telstra and i got really good income and they've grown really well and we had a question recently to come through the podcast which was you know if people are talking about all these shares that have done really well over a really long period of time can etfs provide that long-term compounding and i think the the kind of the core of the question is like in 10 or 20 years, do you think people will look back and say the same stories to their kids or to other people in their lives to be like, hey, uh, you know, I bought the Global X ETF at X and now it's Y and I've got this much in dividends or distributions? I'd say we're already seeing that. So to give a concrete example from our own experience, our gold ETF listed after adjusting the, the, uh, the, the, the split we ran uh, listed at a price close to $5 back in 2003. <laughs> Today, the price is over $25. So there's been something close to a 5x return on our gold ETF. That is way better than most stocks. Not all stocks, but most stocks on the ASX. <laughs> it's not just our gold ETF, of course. There's other ETFs with long track records on the ASX. So, for instance, there's one ASX 200 ETF with over 20 years history, and it has put up, you know, something similar, put up a similar number to our gold ETF. So, from my perspective, we've already seen this for those ETFs that do have long track records and trading histories on the ASX. It's interesting because a lot of people think that, like, I guess maybe because it's not as exciting for people that don't see that long-term compounding. But I remember I had, um, back in the day, I had a really good investor on the podcast and really act, and he's an active investor what ran Australia's big, one of the biggest funds at the time and he said to me people underestimate the growth of an investment in years 5 to 10 and they overestimate the growth of investment in years 1 to 5 because we're just like biased towards the here and now 
but it's those long-term compounders that win. And I think like ETFs are like the the kind of pinnacle of what you can aspire to to do in terms of compounding. I've I saw in your chart something that I thought was really interesting and might be a bit funny for people to kind of hear about, but I'm curious. I know you have the answer, so I am cherry picking this question, but what has performed better, Sydney property prices or shares? Yeah, that, um, there's a number of ways of cutting these numbers and looking at it. But if you just do the simple thing and assume someone has bought a residential property in the median suburb on a fully cash funded basis, so they haven't taken out a mortgage, so there's no gearing on it, mm-hmm. there's no rental income, they just buy the house price in the median Whatever the you know, there's no such thing as a median house, of course. But suppose there were, mm. and you know how indexes work. The answer is um, shares. Mm. Again, it might be a bit of an unfair comparison to some people because the share index assumes that you reinvest dividends, whereas the house just assumes you live in it, you don't rent it out, and there's no mortgage. Mm. But on that basis, shares have actually outperformed property. To have a bit of fun with this question, though. It really depends if you, and some people do for for that matter, like to compare, am I better off buying shares in the ASX 200 or am I better off buying a property? Um, It depends the way about, it depends quite heavily on the way you chart the numbers and what you do. If you buy a house using gearing, so you borrow money, you, you know, take on a mortgage, essentially, that's what uh, having geared property exposure is, a mortgage, Mm. then you should expect the value of your house to outperform the share market simply because there's that element of gearing there. Mm. And hey, at the end of the day, a house is a house. You can live in it. ETFs may be well and good and great, but you can't live in them, right? Yeah. However, if you were to make the comparison fair to ETFs, you'd have to run a simulation whereby you gear your ETF exposure in a similar way that you gear your property exposure when you take on a mortgage. I haven't run that exercise myself. But some of the numbers I have seen do suggest that geared share market exposure does outperform uh, geared property exposure like that. Again, i um, got to be careful with what I say here. I don't want to be interpreted <laughs> no. making any kind of financial advice. And obviously, geared share market exposure comes with huge risks, especially around, market, uh, around margin calls. But um it depends how you run the numbers is mm. all I'm saying. And you might be surprised just how well Australian shares have done. Yeah, I think a lot of us forget how well shares have done. And um, I think it's safe to assume David is not giving us advice on uh, of, of what to do with our property or with our share portfolio. But it's something that we have talked about a lot on the show in the past is, um, you know, how bad those things that do margin calls are. And um, people can go and explore that in their own time. But if you did kind of take out like the element of debt in a property and you could put it side by side with shares, um, over the long term, shares have performed exceptionally well. And even still recently with things like franking credits and dividend reinvestment plans and those types of things, it's actually, I think it, that was one of the first things that caught me off guard with investing. The first two things were how powerful compound interest is. That was the first thing when I plugged that into a money smart calculator, I was like, why am I doing anything else other than dollar cost averaging? And second of all, was how well shares had performed because everyone in my life at the time was just property mad. And um, it wasn't until I saw the numbers, I was like, hold on a second. It, uh, it seems that shares are actually probably a better long-term investment for me. Um, so another, ch- this is the chart, this next one that I'm going to refer to, and we'll put a link in the show notes perhaps to this, was the one that I thought was really interesting because a lot of people, when they think about ETFs versus shares, um, again, they think that ETFs might be just, you know, it's low cost, it's easy to invest in, therefore it's not good. Um, and so people that then go and invest in shares or they try and spice up their ETF portfolio, they might try and market time. They might try and buy this ETF one week, sell it the next week. And they do the same thing with shares. But you come up with a really interesting study that I didn't think I'd seen in Australia. It's, I've seen it overseas, which is this kind of like the, what do you miss out? on if you do yeah. decide to try and trade the market and you miss the really good day. So I won't take the, the punchline away from you, David, but can you just explain what you ran and what you found? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. It has been done overseas and I wanted to run the numbers in Australia to see if the same thing held true here. And the answer is it seems to hold even more so in Australia. Mm. So what did we find? 
So what we did was we looked at the price return of the ASX 200 over the past five years and found what happened to you if you as an investor did the lazy thing and just bought five years ago and did absolutely nothing for five mm. years. And then we looked at what happened to you if in the worst case scenario, highly unlikely, but still theoretically possible that you missed the 20 best days of the ASX 200. And what we found was if you bought the ASX uh, 200 five years ago and did nothing, you had recovered completely from COVID and made something of a profit. By contrast, if you missed those 20 best days, you essentially caught COVID and died. <laughs> you went right the way down to the bottom of the COVID drop, then you flatlined, you never recovered. So I think, as you said, it quite powerfully illustrates the dangers of market timing and why investors might frankly be better off just doing the Rip Van Winkle thing buying a portfolio, buying an asset class, then just falling asleep for however long. Mm. It was interesting because you you also showed like what happens if you miss the 10 best days and the five best mm -hmm. days. And what people often assume then, well, then they go, well, what happens if you just avoided COVID altogether or you didn't invest or like, you know, how many people are worried about the next market crash? But one of the things that always catches me about these types of charts is like a lot of people assume that they could have made a good decision to avoid the market correction in the first place. And what we see, and I could be wrong, maybe you found this in your data, maybe you didn't. But my understanding, David, is that oftentimes the best days are alongside the worst days. So, true. So, true. so you often find that even if you could have avoided the bad days, you almost certainly would have avoided the good days. <laughs> so that's true. Yep. Yeah. So it's just side by side. So yeah. hard, right? Yeah, that's it. And I think it's important to remember there, like you said, that when markets fall, they fall for a reason. And that's because everyone's selling at the same time. So when people look at these exercises and think, oh, I could miss, you know, I'm smarter than everyone else. I can dodge the bad ones and find the good ones, or I can dodge both at once through some sophisticated market timing system. Remember that uh, no one knows the future. Everything you know about the ASX 200 is always also priced into it. Hmm. And there's a lot of data, there's a lot of evidence that shows, you know, what happens to people who do go down that path. And it all shows that it's a very treacherous veil. Mm. So look before you leap. Um, yeah, I remember when I put this out there, everyone was like, well, if you could have just traded around it. And then they showed me some like data that said, well, if you just did this strategy, that's almost as dangerous as trying to Ooh. think you can market time, like relying on that data, in my opinion, because a lot of people that go out and try and prove to you that you could have avoided the crashes. They're using data, which is what we call backtested. That's right. Which, as you know, it's can, like it's fitting the line to the data, not the other way around. That's exactly and, right. And so you try and find the strategy that best fit the previous conditions. But we know the future is different to the past. Like different companies, different stocks, different market right. environments. And it's just, it's. I, I, I can see how new investors get kind of blew it in. Yeah, so easily. It, it makes no. sense to avoid them, but how hard it is indeed. Another yeah. chart, and this is probably the other thing that really jumped out to me, because again, I haven't seen it in Australia, but I've definitely seen it from a professor, uh, Professor Bessenbinder, who ran right. something, yes, run th something similar, and you did this. So I'm just going to hand it straight over to you from here. Tell us what did you do and what did you find from the ASX data? Sure. So I wanted to make the point to investors that diversification is the only free lunch in investing. And my favorite way of illustrating, well, before I do illustrate this and go into this slide, just in my experience, and I'm sure in your experience too, Owen, that with investors, their attitudes towards diversification can be a bit, a little bit like, you know, the attitudes of young men towards calling their mums or their grandmas on the weekend, you know. <laughs> they know they ought to do it, but they sort of put it off until circumstances force a change of habit. Yep. <laughs> so my favorite the way of illustrating how powerful diversification is, is to compare the number of ASX listed ETFs that have provided some kind of positive return, total return over the past five years with how many ASX listed stocks have provided some positive return over the past five years. And again, there's a number of ways of running the numbers here. But if you do what I've done, which is you look at every ASX listed ETF 
mm-hmm. including the bond ETFs, which haven't done that well over the past five years, a lot of them, by the way, and the cash ETFs, you'll find that, I can't remember the exact number in the slide, actually, it's about 85, I think, from me- memory. Percent. 89. Is it higher than that? 89. 89% of ETFs have provided some kind of positive total return over the past five mm. years. And this is all publicly available on the ASX's website. They publish a monthly investment product report. You can go look it out. You can go check it yourself. By contrast, if you look at the number of ASX-listed shares that have provided some kind of positive price return over the past five years, you'll find that it's around 30% of them, That's maybe right. 35% if you come in at a good time. And 35% was uh, the professor you mentioned, uh, Hendrik Bessenbinder at the University of Arizona. That was his number for Australia. He was looking, he ran the numbers in 2019, mm. not long before the COVID uh, thing happened. So a different time. Um, and a lot of people sort of taken aback by this. Well, well, wait a minute. How uh, How is it that only 30% or even in some timelines, 20% of ASX-listed shares have provided any positive return at all. They'll then sometimes go and look at, you know, market index or some website and see that, oh, hang on, isn't it closer to 40%? I can see that 40% of ASX-listed shares have been up over this time horizon. Here, it's very important to remember delistings. Every year on the ASX, it differs year to year. About 140-odd shares get booted off the exchange. They delist <laughs> overwhelmingly because they've performed so badly. So when you do run the numbers and you go, do go back and look at uh, shares on the ASX over the past five years, those delistings are taken out. But when you add those back in and you account for that survivorship bias, yeah, it's the number is quite shockingly low. Mm. Hendrik Essenbinder's numbers was about 35. Mine was about 30. Only a very small minority, of, well, about a third of them, of ASX listed shares provide any positive return at all. So it's <laughs> really quite start, startling. But ETFs, going over to ETFs, again, about 85% of them have provided some kind of positive return. <laughs> again, drilling in on the numbers a little bit, Those numbers I've used there in the slideshow take all ETFs. So it includes bond ETFs, crucially, at this moment in time. If you do a like-for-like, a more apples-to-apples comparison, and just take the ASX share ETFs, so a lot of your viewers will know the names, like VAS from Vanguard, STW from State Street, MVW from VanEck, Mm. those ones, all of them, that I could see on the ASX investment products report have gone up to some extent over the past five years. Hmm. So every vanilla Australian shares ETF has provided a positive return over the past five years, whereas a third at best of ASX listed stocks have once you account for delistings. So for me, that speaks very, very powerfully to diversification and why it matters so much. Hmm. And that's my favorite way of illustrating it. It's uh, it's actually probably mind blowing to people because they're also probably thinking, okay, how does the stock market go up if only thirty percent of the stocks are positive? Uh, and that's because some of them provide a very strong return, but many do not. And that's uh, right. It kind of carries the those few stocks carry the entire market higher. Um, that's right. And again, it's it weighted average. Exactly, and it, re- and it you said it best: weighted average and it kind of reinforces this idea of just how difficult it is to predict which of those stocks will go up. But on that point, yeah. um, so we know ETFs are kind of, from the previous two questions, we know that ETFs are probably best invested in for the long term because they're low cost, they're diversified, they're all these types of things. And for the core of a portfolio, it makes so much sense because you're basically not you know, betting on just finding a few big winners that can kind of lift your portfolio. That said, some people find the uh, the stock market alluring for many different reasons, and maybe if it's contained in a small part of your portfolio, maybe it's okay. But um, in your Prezo, you also mentioned some of the best performing companies, and I'd wondered um, what some of those were and if we could infer anything, if at all. That's right. So the best one I'd seen when I ran the numbers, um, and it's probably changed since, 
was Lion Town Resources, thanks to the lithium boom. Mm. And the reason I put that in there is not to encourage people's gambling instinct, because uh, like you, you know, I take a bet or a view on stocks every now and then just because I, I, I sort of got this gambling instinct that I haven't really <laughs> been able to kill. But the point is this, the, the reason diversification works so well is that your upside when you buy a stock is theoretically infinite. You can find a company like Liontown Resources that had done 7,200% over five years. And theoretically, you know, the stock you buy could do far, far better than that. By contrast, your downside when you buy a stock is capped at 100%. When you buy $100 worth of a share, you could lose all that $100, but you can't lose any more than the money that you put in. Mm. So your downside is capped at 100%, while your upside is theoretically infinite. So in this setting, what we usually see year to year, month to month on the ASX is for those that buy broadly and diversify, those winners in the market, like Liontown Resources, perform so well that they offset the many and far larger in number losers in a portfolio. <laughs> and in this context, it's more important to bag the winners that is to get the lion town resources of the world into your portfolio than it is to dodge the losers. And that's the mathematics of why diversification is so important and why I put that in there. Mm. Because a lot of people think, right, um, that's so, that, and this actually goes really deep. I know you and I could probably talk about this for hours actually, mm. in that diversification actually helps you capture winners, not just, and people think by capturing winners, it's a strategy for growth and it's a strategy for, you know, some type of doing better than average. And it probably is if you think about it that way. But the reality is that when you diversify, you actually capture winners that you don't, didn't expect to be winners. Um, right. yeah, and you that is actually a pr protective mechanism in itself because you're effectively, you are buying the market and you're getting that exposure to the market as a whole. Uh, I'll quickly run through just some of the other names just on here. And I'm, I've got a takeaway from this. It was Lion Town Resources, Red Hill Minerals, uh, Silex Systems, Chalice Mining, o IODM, never even heard of that one, Capricorn Metals, Fortescue Metals, which is probably the only one that people have really heard about, Predictive Discovery, Telex Pharmaceuticals, and DeGray Mining. Now, I know from the very limited understanding that I have that a lot of those companies yep. are like mining and resources and like I just think about, and one of them is a pharmaceutical company, and I just think to myself, if people knew where gold or lithium was going to be in the ground, um, they wouldn't tell the rest of the world about it. And so uh, they're going out there trying to find those things as well. And so um, to to think that a public market investor who buys shares could determine wh which company is going to strike literal gold or lithium is is incredibly rare and incredibly hard to fathom. Yeah. Um, but by buying a diversified ETF, you may get exposure to some of these names anyway, like say Fortescue, for example, uh, which is a popular one in most ASX, um, I guess, ETFs. Uh, so I, I guess that was kind of my takeaway from that. I don't know if you had any others, but if if you didn't, I'm happy to move on to the next question. No, 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 no. I've um, I've got no takeaways beyond yours. Okay, great. Um, so I guess one of the things is that um, paying a professional fund manager, you said at the top of the show, may come at a slight cost to say index ETF, which you can buy on the market. It's automatically adjusted for the fees that are taken out. It's quick and easy. One of the things that you included in your Prezo, which was quite interesting to me, and it's a kind of take on not just the index active versus passive, it was also a look across different types of markets because other, as more investors are now looking towards bonds and fixed income type things, um, they're looking not just at shares in Australia or the US, but they're looking across different asset classes. So I'm curious like where you think passive and active has a role and what the data revealed to you in in your research. Yeah. So I might sound like a, a, a bit of a, a polemicist here uh, in making this statement, but I think for the vast majority of Australian investors who don't have access to some of the world's best fund managers. The answer is that the place of an active manager in your portfolio is nowhere. Hmm. 
nowhere at all. And I hate, I, I don't take any joy in saying this, but I think it is true to some extent that we really, as a country, don't need a large bevy of professional active fund managers. They subtract economic value. They make more people, they make no one richer than themselves. I've got to say that these active fund managers are best at making, best, best at enriching themselves rather than other people. And um, I think the data backs this up. If you look at the, if you compare the returns side by side of passive index funds to their competitor active fund managers in any point in the share market, we've seen time and time again that especially mm -hmm. over longer time periods, index funds outperform. This debate is really done and dusted and more or less everyone on the street accepts it, except the active fund managers themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, this, this is a bit of a, a, a polemical, again, I'm going to be a bit polemical here. There, there's a quote from, um, the, do you know the novel American Psycho? Yeah. Um, and his character, Patrick Bateman. Mm -hmm. um, there is this, um, but what, one of the most powerful quotes in that book, in my opinion, is, is this one here, which I've got written down where he says, um, I stare into a thin web-like crack above the urinal's handle and think to myself that if I were to disappear into that crack, the odds are that no one would notice that I was gone and no one would care. Ellipsis. Some people truly do not need to be here. Um, <laughs> a, bit of a, a bit of a stir the pot kind of a quote. But for me, most of the active management industry does not need to be here. It subtracts economic value. We as a country would be better off without it. It's not true of all active managers. Some really do add value. But for the mm -hmm. overwhelming majority of the industry, again, yeah, yeah not going to make any friends from saying that. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, think, I think that should probably be, for what it's worth, I think that should be everyone's first default reaction right it's like yeah. prove to me why you deserve to be in my portfolio prove it to me you know and it's so hard to know in advance um which fund managers might perform how long uh, well for how long like it's like so many different variables um i did this as a profession as you may know yeah. david I, I reviewed um professional fund managers for a, a while before uh, um, i did not know that okay, yeah that's good to know yeah and right. and it, and it's true, right? Like it, I see it in the data as well. Like, uh, so you've seen how the sausage is made, then. You've, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, you know, interviewing mm. hundreds of fund managers on our investors podcast, and so um, I see it. And uh, I think that's why we're increasingly moving, like as an industry. Uh, fortunately, Globalx has been there for a long time, but and you've been there, but I, um, even RAS, but beyond that. People are increasingly moving to a core and a satellite approach, and predominantly that core is passive. And I think um, I, my personal view is that everyone should have at almost an entirely passive core. And when I say passive, it could mean like smart beta. It could mean like just boring old vanilla ETFs. It could mean anything really that's just low cost and diversified and simple to understand, um, commodities even. So... Um, I'm curious, and I would like it if you could. You don't have to, but mm. if you could share your view on the core and the satellite exposure, mm. and also the types of ETFs that might go in there, and feel free to like mention GlobalX ETFs because a lot of our audience will want you to say that and say, "Hey," then I can say, "Go and check it out on the website and put links in the show notes." Of course, but if we just take this core and a satellite idea, which they're pretty familiar with, um, how would you explain that to the rest community? Yeah, so the core of a portfolio is very much the sensible sleep easy at night, proven and time tested, build long term wealth, put most of your money part of your portfolio. And in our experience, dealing with advisors, dealing with direct investors to the extent that we do, it, we tend to see the core makes up anything between 60 and 90% of an investor's assets. What goes into it? Like you said, low cost well-diversified index funds, often around the core of the Australian share market, the core of the US or the global share market. One fund we provide here is the N100 ETF. That's the ticker. Mm -hmm. And then around the core of the Australian and US bond markets too. 
I like to think that you should also place commodities, some small amount of commodities, or at least some other alternative, perhaps like property, as an, another example, mm-hmm. in the core of your portfolio too, just so that you're a little better diversified. And we have seen our gold ETF become one of the largest ETFs in the country on the back of that. People adding it to the core of their portfolios in that alternatives bucket. The satellite of the portfolio is the rest of it, anything from 40% to 10%. And from my perspective, the purpose of a satellite is to sort of um, absorb that gambling instinct that you can't quite (laughs) kill that we spoke about before. People are people. They like to express views on things. They like to express opinions. They like to explore and test new ideas. That's what it means to be human. And in stock markets, sometimes it'll work for you. Sometimes it won't. Leave a smaller side, a smaller portion of your money aside that you can you sort of you know have as that outlet for your more adventurous instinct. And in the satellite portion of a portfolio, we see all kinds of things. Some people will want to take the approach of picking direct stocks. I think the data would suggest that you'd be better off picking ETFs Mm -hmm. rather than stocks. And we do see some of the more interesting and colourful ETFs appear in the satellites of portfolios too. So one example that we offer might be something like the hydrogen ETF. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen obviously is going to be very important for this energy transition, but at at this stage at least, it's much too early to know what that looks like. So if you want to express a view on that, that's where it goes. In the satellite of your portfolio, a smaller Mm -hmm. allocation compared to the core. And Mm -hmm. um, as part of that, of course, more risk. Mm. I love it. Um, The one that I was thinking of, because only because I've got still got the names of those companies on my screen here, is um, even things like the ACDC ETF is something yep. that like it's much more mature than the hydrogen ETF, but at the same time, and it probably doesn't include a lot of those companies because they're probably too speculative for it, but it does provide exposure to like battery and lithium, which is yep. there's more, more and more Teslas and BYDs and all that sort of stuff on the street now when you look outside. Um, and I feel yeah. like that could be one. That could be one, Absolutely. And the fact is with thematic ETFs, I mean, sometimes people can think that they're a bit too much for them or that they're a bit, in some cases, silly. But the fact is with an ETF that's well diversified, there's only, you know, so far that you can go wrong. ACDC, as luck would have it, has been one of the best performing thematic ETFs out there. And um, we're very, very, very happy with it. Um, But um, yeah, that would be one to answer Mm. the question. Mm. I like it. Um, well, David, this has been a heap of fun. I'm glad that you actually brought something polarizing to the chat. Um, if anyone that knows you knows that you, you know, you're very well mannered and very articulate in how you speak. And then um, to bring that to the table, I'm very, very impressed that you said that. And it's very clear thinking like of you. Like it's just like, this is the answer um, that I think, in my opinion, after doing this for so long. Um, and so we really appreciate that. But I will put a link in the show notes to. Uh, many of your your insights and those types of things that are on the Global X website, as well as uh, linking back to all the things that we reference in this this discussion. So, mate, uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, if if I don't see you again, ha- Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. But um, all the best with your uh, your punts for twenty twenty four with your small stocks. I hope that's uh, not the core of your portfolio, but it doesn't sound no. like it is. Not at all. He says, "Okay, that's great." Yeah. Well, David, yeah. thanks for taking some time to join me today. Thanks a lot, Owen, and Merry Christmas to you too.